Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the final virtual event that the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of Climate Week NYC. Uh, it's part of a partnership under which the Columbia Climate School is the official university partner for Climate Week this year. My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School and the founding director here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And today we are going to discuss the road ahead for the electric vehicle market. Uh, let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live. The full video will be available online later today. Our discussion is also being recorded as a special edition of our weekly podcast, Columbia Energy Exchange, and it will be available via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. For those of you joining via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, our two guests today are well known to all of you, so I will keep the introductions very brief. Jim Farley is president and chief executive officer of the Ford Motor Company, a role he assumed just about a year ago. He also serves as a member of the company's board of directors and was previously its chief operating officer. And Mary Nichols is a uh, the longtime chair of the California Air Resources Board. Since she attended the first Earth Day in 1970, she has been one of America's leading environmental champions for many years. She is now also a distinguished visiting fellow to our great pleasure here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, and we're so lucky to have her as part of the Columbia community. If you were to choose two leaders at the forefront of the two sectors most central to a clean transportation transition, automakers and environmental regulators, uh, you'd have Jim and Mary at the top of your list. So we're really delighted to have them both with us here today. Uh, Jim and Mary know each other well. I'm certain this conversation is gonna be more interesting the less I say. So I'm gonna offer some prompts, get the discussion going, and they're gonna engage in a dialogue with one another, uh, pose questions to one another. Uh, Jim, let me start uh, with you. You obviously had a very high profile announcement of the Ford F-150 Lightning recently, the Mustang Mach-E. Just start at a very high level, sort of how it's going, how you feel about how the customer response has been. And you know, since rolling these out, how has your view positively or negatively uh, changed, if it has, about the outlook for EVs? Are customers ready for them? Is the sort of tipping point when this is gonna take off, uh, is it finally here? It seems so. The Mustang mach -E is sold out in the US, Europe, and China. Uh, not just a little sold out, like a year sold out. Um, the enthusiasm for the product is very high. 80% of the customers are new. And the F-150 is probably the one I watch the closest. It's America's best-selling vehicle overall for 40 years now. And uh, electrifying that, uh, was something I think we all at Ford were watching carefully to see if the electrification adoption would move into the mainstream. Um, the vehicles sold in kind of the upper Midwest and the uh, lower middle south of the country, so it's very different usage as well. And we have 150,000 orders, uh, so uh, it's it's quite actually overwhelming right now uh, to see the adoption our European business, we're seeing the whole market being more than 10% um, with pure battery electric and plug-in is another 10%. So Europe is now 20% uh, vehicles with a plug. Uh, and obviously China is accelerating really quickly at very different price points. So I think it's going faster um, as more brands like Ford come into the market with compelling products. I, I do have to say, the product execution has a big, maybe a bigger factor than whether it's an electric car or not. So the responsibility is kind of on us to surprise customer with the execution. And that seems to be driving the demand, not just uh, electrification. Jason, I'd like to just jump in yeah, on please, that one because uh, that's exactly what we've been hoping for in the state of California. We uh, actually uh, launched and spun off a nonprofit organization called Velos, which Ford is a member of, along with others, uh, that is designed to try to make the case and educate people about electric vehicles. And what we learned was that, first of all, the people weren't aware that they even existed or that there were any uh, vehicles out there that would meet their particular needs. 
And I think we finally um, begun to turn that around. Uh, then the issue was, okay, I, these look great, but um, I don't know where I'm going to charge it. And we're still working uh, on that problem in a, in a pretty serious way. And then the third, of course, is, um, you know, can I afford it? And uh, California has put money on the table uh, that we've raised through uh, fees, basically on carbon pollution uh, that we have used to help accelerate by bringing down the cost to people who, who buy the vehicles, but they're still, um, you know, not not available for everybody, even the used vehicles. Uh, in fact, there's a very hot demand for uh, many of the of the new uh, new versions of electric vehicles that uh, that are out there. So um, it's we can't say that the job is done yet, and I don't think we will be able to say it's done until people don't even ask the question, is it electric or not? I mean, wouldn't that be the goal is that um, there's a car there that happens to be electric and it's got all the functionality and the, you know, you can charge it and drive it wherever you want to go, but um, you're not making a big decision with your life about whether you're going to get away from an internal combustion engine. Yeah, is that, um, Jim, when I listen to you talk about the Ford F-150 Lightning, you know, it is, and, and it sounds tremendous. It's, you know, you, you want one of those, the performance, the trunk where the engine used to be, the software, the technology. Um, it's not as much about climate change or about emissions. I guess what I'm asking is, you know, if, if climate change were magically solved by some technology tomorrow, is your view that this would happen anyway? Because this is a better car. It is a better car. Personally, it took me a long time to get there. Um, but to Mary's point, there's a bit of an irony here on the F-150 Lightning. One of the most popular features of the F-150 Lightning is the fact that you can power your house for three days. Uh, and ironically, we're seeing more extreme weather events with global warming. And so people are kind of looking at these vehicles, not just for the propulsion, but for some of the other benefits of electrifying a job site or running your house. Uh, and and the demand for this was real accelerated after what happened in Texas. Um, and so it's kind of, I, it, well, it's just all intertwined. But these weather events driven by climate change are getting people more interested in kind of the non-propulsion part of these vehicles, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So you haven't seen it cut the other way, which is, you know, if if the lights have to go down sometimes in California because of risk of wildfires or, or you have hurricanes that are taking out the grid or severe weather in Texas or Louisiana, that's making people more reluctant to go electric. You're seeing the opposite because they feel like there's resiliency benefit there. Well, if you if you have bi-directional charging and you design the vehicle for that, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of electrons in those batteries uh, to run the rest of your life. I, I guess it's kind of... Mary's vision always is, is, you know, look, this is kind of a better uh, vehicle. I think it's impossible to answer the question, you know, would this happen anyways? Um, but I will tell you, uh, the manufacturing of the vehicle is a good example of the second order of issues we're facing now. On one hand, it's 20 or 30% less labor. Mm -hmm. um, on the other, and so we have to solve that labor overhang uh, at Ford. On the other hand, you know, it's a simpler product and so it breaks less. Uh, so it's better for the customer in terms of their pocketbook because the real expensive pieces that, that really are ex too expensive for people to afford like engine and transmission, you know, those are massively solved with an electric vehicle. Um, but there are, there are other issues now we have to deal with. And what about the dealers whose income comes more from the repairs than it does from the uh, sale of the car? We got to do something about them too, right? It's a really interesting and important point you mentioned. You know, our industry, Model T, uh, we always looked at the after sales experience as, you know, profitable enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I think the electric vehicle is going to really challenge that assumption um, is the value in the vehicle itself and maybe the after sales is, is not a profit uh, endeavor like it has been for us. We only retain 20% of the customers after our warranty expires. 
Mm-hmm. We probably need to change the way we look at that. Um, and uh, But the employment risk, Mary, you're absolutely right. It's something I think about every day with this transition, the employment risk. There's so many tales to it that we are not talking about. So uh, you mentioned the bi-directional charging issue, which has been of interest to me ever since the Fukushima disaster, when, as I understand it, Japan actually uh, was able to keep their economy going to the extent that they were able to, which was pretty amazing when you think about it, um, because that people used their cars basically to to keep uh, factories going as well as their as well as their own homes, but we don't hear much about that here except as a as a possibility for the future. Is that something that you all are involved in? Yeah, it's a good question. We designed our vehicles to do it, Mary. Right now, basically, the vehicle will be able to power your home. But selling electrons back to the grid, which these, this could be a big solution to our energy issues and the grid issues uh, for peak demand, you know, we haven't worked that out. It's very interesting because the solar industry has done it, but it was a really painful process about how to, you know, sell electrons back to the grid from personal uh, solar systems. We are just starting that discussion with the Edison Institute and some you know, forward leaning uh, utilities like the ones in California. I don't know how to handicap it um, because, it, you know, look at us, we're the biggest commercial uh, brand. So it would be really exciting for small business plumbers, electricians. They would go to electrification faster if they could sell their, their electrons back to the grid when the grid needed them, maybe at a pricing premium. But right now there's no mechanism to do that. And so we're kind of left just charging their business or running their business or running the home, not selling it back yet. Mm-hmm. And the mechanism is really on government, right? I mean, yes. we heavily regulate the utility industry, uh, maybe not as much as some of my fellow regulators would like, but still they, they don't make a move without knowing that they're going to be able to uh, get recovery from it. So yeah, it doesn't feel like it's at the top of the agenda where it probably needs uh, needs to be at this point. Boy, I totally, completely agree with you. And, and we're really dealing with this now, actually talking to our commercial, because we have the E-Transit and the Lightning commercial coming out. We're 50% of the light duty commercial vehicles in the US, 50. So if you're doing work with a vehicle uh, in the US, 50% of them are a Ford. So we have this, and we're the first one to have an electric van and an electric pickup, uh, and we're number one in both segments. So we have a real chance for these small business owners, you know. But then it gets into the utility pricing, like if the pricing to buy to charge at two in the morning is advantageous, you know, for them to charge, and then you know maybe they make money selling it back with a different pricing at peak. Um, I don't know how that all works out in the wash <laughs> for 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 the governments, for these utilities, for people's affordability. But we have to we have to do that now. Jim, what's the uh, you know? It's interesting to think about the reaction of dealers of of auto mechanics. Um, my my dad was an auto mechanic. We may not need as many of those, given how less how much less repair these EVs need. What's been the internal reaction? You're you're a huge company. Nearly all your workers make internal combustion engine cars and they excel at it and they're proud of it. How do they feel when you tell them we're not going to do that anymore? I mean, not anymore, but in the long term, this is where we're headed. We're headed somewhere different. There's a lot of tension. Um, there's a lot of tension among our um, among our factory workers who make engine and transmissions, among our dealerships who are seeing lower repair rates, as Mary said. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's, I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad both of you brought it up because I don't feel like it is a top of agenda. I, I think the Biden administration has been very clear as they looked in incentives that they want to incentivize vehicles made here um, so that, you know, and, and how we're dealing with it is we're vertically integrating. So we're starting to make batteries, things like that, and that's labor. The problem is it's not in the same location <laughs> as you know, you can ship an engine transmission pretty much across the country and it's still kind of pencils. You cannot do that with batteries. So the, the, as we vertically integrate to secure people's jobs, 
um, they're not in the same place. They have to be really close to the plant, unlike an engine or transmission that can be shipped a long distance um, because they're so heavy. Uh, so I think these transitions are going to be tough. And, is, and the stakeholders involved right now are just starting to get a feel for what's at, you know, what's at risk. Uh, so I would say early days, I would say kind of the second inning of a nine inning ball game. And um, people are, you know, wondering and asking questions and expecting the company to have answers. <laughs> well, uh, there probably are more questions than answers at this point, but I think it's good that people should be aware of that because uh, sometimes when I read the, the press that, uh, uh, you know, including the trade press that I see, um, every time somebody raises a question, it's, oh my God, that's the end of the electric vehicle. We found the fatal flaw. You know, the fatal flaw is mm -hmm. the mining of the minerals for mm -hmm. the batteries or where the battery plant's going to be built or will there be enough chips? So, you know, there's always an obstacle, right? Um, and yet I don't hear you saying that's slowing you down. It's just that you're trying to stay ahead of uh, the curve, at least hopefully. Yeah, and to your point, it's interesting, um, Mary, what you say, because it, it's gonna force us to work together in ways we've never worked together. So like government, you know, um, the mining industry, um, you know, we, we have to solve this ourselves together. And I'm already starting to see alignment that where there was never alignment before. Uh, and yet, and yet we have to go beyond just kind of agreeing. We have to actually have creative solutions. Um, so much of our supply chain is overseas. so much. And, and to bring that back to the U S from batteries to silicon, to mining, no one wants a mine in their neighborhood, um, you know, but we have to mine <laughs> or else we're going to be shipping these materials halfway around the world, uh, to your point. So I, I do think we have a can do attitude. We're excited about solving these, but I, I don't think we've really gotten into it seriously yet. Which of these, yeah. sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Mary. No, I was just going to say you and I, uh, Jim and I serve as co-chairs of a commission on future mobility, and that commission is uh, trying to grapple with some of these questions, and it does include representatives from uh, across the uh, across the uh, spectrum of, of groups and businesses that are interested in mobility uh, and the future, of course, and and from all parts of the globe. Uh, pretty much, uh, at least every continent other than Antarctica, I guess. Uh, but um, we still, I think, are having a hard time, even as a group of, uh, of, of people with, you know, experience and, and uh, some claims to leadership, um, framing some of the really big sort of scary questions about, um, not just about how people are going to move around and uh, have the freedom to move, but also how our stuff is going to move, the the whole uh, freight sector, which, uh, you know, Ford also has a big stake in, um, but that puts you in the business of urban planning, right? And other ideas of different models for for how people are going to uh, get stuff and, and uh, own things. Jim, go ahead. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Well, right. I was just going to say to Mar to Mary's point, um, you know, look, we're all excited about full automation. We had a major milestone for me personally. Went to Pittsburgh and Argo, and I think you know they can beat an undistracted driver um, in certain circumstances, like a lot of the SDS capability. But you know, if you look at um, if you look at shared mobility and the TNCs. Um, yeah, that's a business. And what responsibilities Ford have as we develop that new technology for access? I get really concerned about the affordability of these BEVs and the affordability or, or will should the cities have policies? If you want to run an AV business in your city, you know, you have to provide access to underserved communities. We, we have to kind of figure that out because we want this technology not to be just cheaper. We want it to be, we want it to do some good um, beyond just saving people uh, money. 
And I, I, I think actually, Mary, that's where, you know, what you've put together really allows us to start experimenting or talking mm -hmm. to that one. Um, will that be an, you know, will that be something Ford should put as a priority as we roll out level four autonomy? I, we haven't really talked about it in the company, but it feels like we should be that kind of company. We've identified a lot of potential challenges. So we made a lot of progress. We're not, we're not there yet. Workforce and, and, and mining and technology, charging infrastructure. Um, I want to ask about the role of government to address some of those. Where is there a role for government? Where isn't there? And maybe Jim, to start with you, what, what would be the most impactful things you think government could do? There's subsidies, there's building the charging infrastructure, there's government procurement, there's other tools it has. What do you, what would you like, what would be helpful to see from government? Well, I'd love to hear from Mary actually, but, um, you know, from my, my standpoint at Ford, you know, it, it's really important that customers are really smart. So they do the math. So we have to continue to get the support from government leaders to make the, uh, the economics, put their foot on the scale of the economics and make this work for more customers. I think that adoption is going to be really important. Uh, it's necessary, but certainly not sufficient. Uh, support on charging, which Mary already mentioned, I'd love to hear her thoughts on that, um, are, 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 are of course really important. But I've watched countries like Norway go 50% electric for many years. And, you know, it seems like customers are really smart about kind of figuring out the charging problem. Um, I, I think more actually about government's help to create a circular supply chain locally um, in the US, uh, chips, batteries, mining. Uh, I think that, you know, recycling. I, I'd love for us to be a little bit more <laughs> aggressive in, in starting to explore solutions where we can not just have adoption of electric, but actually create a circular supply base that creates jobs and, um, and it all works together, and which just, is not how we did it. Like our business is wired up almost the opposite of that today. And just to clarify, and then I want to obviously hear Mary talk about the role of government, that that, that supply chain, uh, uh, bring it home is about jobs or is it also about security? I mean, do you view that as a, a risk for the company to have these massive global supply chains where the minerals and everything else for the EVs are coming from all over the world? Yeah. So take chips, for example, because there are automobiles, people are going 70 miles an hour, uh, in 40 degree below zero in the North Slope of Alaska, you know, we use 25 nanometer or larger feature uh, silicon chips. Um, those are not the latest technology, but they're super important for cars to, to operate in all different conditions. You know, TSMC, the, the largest wafer and semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan, and auto is 4% of their production. So today with the supply chain, problems, you know, we're really relying on TSMC to, to kind of get us out of the shortage. And we're only 4% of what they do. Um, and they're a long way away from the United States of America. Uh, and feature rich chips like the ones we use for most of our functions are not the key business. They're make, you know, they're making for personal electronics, 5G routers, you know, 10, 12 nanometer smaller chips. So I, I think it just the chip uh, situation is a very sober reminder of if you don't have a local supply base and as well from an environmental standpoint, you don't have a control over that supply base, uh, you know, I, I think the solution in total isn't optimal. Mary, can you talk about what you'd like to see from government and also obviously given your, your, your career, um, what's at the federal level, what's at the state level? <laughs> Well, sure. So uh, first of all, as you uh, pointed out, and as anyone can see who's looking at their screen, I have been working in this field for a long time. And a couple of things uh, popped to mind. So one is uh, when we first started seriously regulating tailpipe emissions uh, in California and at the federal level, um, we pushed very hard uh, for the catalytic converter. And uh, it was invented, uh, but not from within one of the OEMs. It was an outside company, you know, that came up with the catalyst idea, and then it had to be 
holds it on in effect, you know, at the at the end of the of the process. And then eventually the, the manufacturers, once they knew they were going to have to uh, go that route, reconfigured the rest of the vehicle to optimize for performance and fuel economy and so forth. And so it all finally came together at the end. Um, I don't think I ever heard the term supply chain mentioned in those days. I don't think I knew what it was, although I guess you could figure it out. But um, we were criticized a lot for having created a regulatory environment in which um, cars were going to have to utilize uh, precious metals, which is what they needed in those days for the catalysts to work. You know, we were going to be beholden basically to South Africa and maybe to Russia. Uh, and that was a serious argument. And um, uh, basically the regulators either stood their ground or didn't move very much. And what happened was that um, newer, better ways of making catalysts and um, that, that didn't require all that uh, imported precious metal uh, were created. I think the same thing is already beginning to appear with batteries, where people are much more seriously looking at uh, what materials are going into the batteries and how to make them more recyclable, reusable, et cetera. That in and of itself, I think, will um, change, the, change the dynamics. But during those years, uh, we had on the a resources board a man who's no longer uh, alive, but uh, he was a longtime researcher in the for the Air Force. Uh, he was a he was a chemist and uh, you know really a, a combustion expert. But he had lived through World War II, and um, he was uh, constantly reminding us about how necessary it was to focus on manufacturing capacity because as I think most people know, it was the uh, manufacturing capacity of the United States and specifically the auto industry um, that was as responsible as anything uh, for the fact that World War II came to an end successfully uh, in, in Europe and that we were able as a country that hadn't been geared up on a war footing you know, to, uh, to, to win. Um, my point being, I guess, that um, it's impossible now to think about these issues, electric vehicles per se, without thinking about them in this bigger context of the, what this means to the economy as a whole and to the country's security as a, as a whole. And um, that's what government should be doing. So to to get to your question, you know, there are big policy issues embedded in all of these questions. And yet government is no better able at the state level or the federal level to solve for all of them at the same time. Um, you know, then uh, it, it's, it's not where, you know, we might wish it could be where somebody could just figure this all out and, you know, come up with the solutions right away. Uh, to me, it, it's going to involve some evolution, which we don't have a lot of time for, but we have a little, and it's going to involve the kind of collaboration that Jim was referring to earlier. So I see the dynamic as being one where, you know, people like me or those who succeeded me um, can set policy goals and objectives and standards but then it's gonna be up to the private sector to come up with the um, plan for, for example, if we're gonna share responsibility for charging uh, to get you know, down to the really basic nitty gritty, um, you know, am I gonna come up with a map that shows where every charging station should be? No, I mean, I may be able to show where there's a need and do some things to make sure that no communities are omitted, but you know, this is not going to be something that government is just going to roll out. So it's going to have to be done in a in a dynamic way. It's a really interesting perspective about the role of how, how policymakers should think about their role and, and with some humility. I'm, I'm curious, just a quick follow up, how you think about the potential tension between different policy objectives. So if we want as many EVs as fast as possible, climate is a crisis, uh, you might say, you know, don't restrict it, don't link it to other goals that we also want, like high paying jobs and unionized labor. But that in DC right now is the proposal on the table for how to restrict the tax credits. 
How, how do you think about potential tension between different policy objectives? Well, it's easy for me, of course, as an air pollution person to say, forget about all this other stuff, right? It's just, to, just about climate and local community pollution. Um, and I do think those are the values that probably will uh, prevail in the sense that other things can come along with those. Uh, they can't be ignored once they're once they're raised. But I think if you were to say, you know, the vehicles have to be 100% safe and there can never be an accident, which sometimes is what it seems like we're striving for, you know, between the tort system and the regulatory system, um, you know, that would that would be the end. I mean, th that would be complete, you'd be stalled because there's no such thing as perfection in that area. So there does have to be some give and take among our different our different social objectives. But, you know, getting back to what uh, Jim was really talking about before in terms of affordability and value to the public for the work that a, a company like Ford does, um, I think it's important that um, that that they are thinking about the future workforce and not just the current workforce and how to crank out as many EVs quickly as they can. And I think that it shouldn't, you know, keep us in stasis forever, but to take a little bit of time while we're designing policies to make sure we're at least um, have answers to, you know, approaches to answering those, those kinds of questions. Um, I think that's, that's uh, where we should be. Jim, I, we're going to bring students in in a moment to talk with both of you. And one thing before we do that, that I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about, we obviously have one of this country's leading environmental regulators here. We've been talking about the role of government with a somewhat U.S. focus. You're, you're a very global company. We've been talking about some of the challenges um, from, again, mining technology, the charging infrastructure, workforce. Um, how different do those look in different parts of the world? And what is the outlook for EVs in emerging markets in developing countries? What needs to happen to make that uh, change going forward and how different is it? It's very different. Um, it's, it's stark, actually. Um, the, the wealthier consumers in Europe and China now uh, have lots of, uh, lots of choices and the governments are, are, are working very carefully uh, to to make sure that customers are considering electric vehicles, but when you get to India and and many other places, um, you know it's completely different physics <laughs> of the consumer's affordability, uh, road condition, everything is just so different. Uh, and uh, I, we have an expression, you know, maybe in our industry, if you can make it in India, you can make it anywhere because. They, they have the lowest, you know, price paid of any vehicle. Um, and yet, and they have a great desire at the government level there to, to, to make EVs uh, attractive. But the reality is, um, you know, it's not going very fast at all. Um, and, and I could see that for so many emerging markets that we're in, because uh, we continue to sell uh, Ranger pickup trucks in those markets. We're number one or number two and pretty much all of them for that segment. Um, and EVs, you know, not a lot of consideration, not a lot of interest. Um, and the government support is, you know, they have they have pretty fundamental roles in, in those places for the government. Uh, so I, I'd say kind of right now in the second inning, it's a bit of the have and the have nots, uh, really. Uh, that's what I see from the marketplace. Um, and I'm sure we'll get innovation just like Henry Ford in place like India. And that would be really exciting. Uh, but for now, you know, it's really the manufacturer's intent uh, would, would drive us to, to really make EVs affordable at a completely different level mm -hmm. than North America, Europe, Australia, you know, China. And one, one more question from me, because we, we, we talked about the US, I wanted to ask you about the rest of the world. We've also talked a lot about passenger cars uh, or, or pickup trucks, um, where I think you can see line of sight for electrification there. There's maybe some more uncertainty about what the solutions will be to address emissions uh, for trucks, for commercial vehicles. Is that electrification? Is it 
hydrogen fuel cells or something else. Talk a little bit about where you see the technology going beyond cars. Yeah, I have to say, again, we're very fortunate for whatever reason there's something in the water. We do commercial vehicles really naturally everywhere in the world. Uh, we're kind of number one brand in Europe and for vans, even pickups, believe it or not. And, um, you know, what I see is really different reality than passenger cars. Today in Europe, 90% of vans are diesel. And passenger cars, 20% have a plug. So, you know, the transition's going a lot slower for commercial vehicles. Uh, commercial vehicles in China are really different, you know, three wheelers, that kind of thing. You know, they are actually going to uh, EV very quickly in China. Um, so, but I'd say in general, commercial vehicles are 10 years behind. Uh, they usually have depot charging, point-to-point uh, -point charging. Actually, it should be easier to go to electric for commercial. They're, they run their business. They're, you know, they're, those vehicles, they're really attentive to the cost. Uh, the prognostics, the vehicles being down uh, has a lot bigger impact for a business in terms of the pocketbook than an individual customer. So we're investing heavily there. Um, and it's really exciting for us to see, for example, the U.S. get serious about like incentives around commercial vehicles, because I think that's an area that's really been under discussed and a much bigger, a huge opportunity. Some countries, a third of the fleet are commercial light duty vehicles. And it's like we're not even talking about electrification of them. So uh, again, for everyone watching online, uh, my name is Jason Bordoff. We're here with Jim Farley, the president and CEO of Ford, and, and Mary Nichols, a distinguished visiting fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, former chair of, the, of CARB, the California Resources Board, discussing priorities, challenges for the electric vehicle market. And we're now going to open it to questions from the audience. Uh, for those of you joining via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time, clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. But first, I'm going to ask a few of our students to join us on screen here with Jim and Mary. And we're going to start by having Amit Khatri join us on camera. Amit is an MPA student at the School of International and Public Affairs. Amit, your question. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's clearly acknowledged that the role of regulation, policy, and investments in building demand is a key factor in the future of the electric vehicle market. But there is also an urge to have domestic supply chain production instead of maybe relying on imports. Uh, this usually and many times leads to delays and higher costs. So is there a middle way out of this scenario? Who wants to take that? Jim, you want to take that? Right, I could give it a, a try. So. Um, well, currently in Europe and in North America and in China, the demand for well-executed electric vehicles is high enough that um, you know I think we can we can uh, I, I think we'll <laughs> we'll do what we need to 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 build the vehicles. Uh, I, I think the supply chain, uh, circular and local, is going to take years to address. Years to address. It will take a long time. Uh, and as Mary said. We'll have to work together in new ways with government and geos um, to to accomplish that. Uh, it will take a lot of government policy. I'm really excited to hear the Biden administration make the commitment to localize, you know, feature rich semiconductors, batteries, uh, other electrical components here. But it's going to take a long time. You know, we we didn't invest in battery chemistry in the U.S. Uh, that's really the Asian. Asian countries did and the Asian companies did. Uh, and, and it will take a long time to transition. Same for semiconductors. Um, so it's just gonna take time. Maybe I would just add to that, that there's a trend which has been apparent for quite a few years now, uh, where smaller companies are finding ways to partner up with larger companies because they can't make the kind of investments all, all across the board that are needed to make these transitions happen. And uh, the old idea that every country had to have its own domestic car, you know, the, the one that fit that particular uh, country is sort of 
disappeared. Uh, but I think that trend is going to accelerate as a result of the competing demand for much more uh, affordable uh, vehicles, but at the same time to have, you know, more stuff uh, built locally where it's closer to the market. I'm going to take a question from the chat and then and then we'll uh, turn to our next student after that. So uh, there's a question from the chat, Mary, from uh, your friend David Sandelow, our inaugural fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, about this question of bidirectionality that, that Jim mentioned. So his question is about the role of regulation. Could CARB play a role in promoting that? How would it do that, like provide bonus credits for bio-directionally enabled EBS or something like that? What can government do? Sure. Well, uh, certainly uh, CARB has a role in setting um, the emission standards, which have now you know, morphed into uh, direct mandates for electric vehicles. And as part of complying with the uh, executive order uh, for the governor, from the governor to accelerate that uh, so that we're at 100% of new sales uh, being all uh, zero emission vehicles by, by 2035, uh, we're going to have to see um, some additional bells and whistles written into those regulations, which are now just in the process of being developed. So I think bi-directionality is certainly one of the features that could be uh, written in as a, as a way of uh, accomplishing some of this goal. Uh, there is work going on he here in California, and I'm sure in other places, but at the Public Utilities Commission to try to develop uh, stronger uh, regulations around um, the uh, electric utilities also providing for uh, bi-directionality. And um, I think there's a, a huge amount of interest, I think, as Jim suggested earlier, um, because of, and, and you also in your introduction, introduction pointed out that, um, you know, if your car can be your power plant, your power supply uh, during an emergency situation, that adds a whole new level of interest to um, investing in a, in a new uh, electric vehicle. So our next uh, video question comes from Lucia Bragg, uh, one of my former students, and now a student in the inaugural class, master's class, master's program at the New Climate School here at Columbia. Lucia, thanks. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. So there have been a number of high profile electric vehicle fires uh, recently amid growing pledges uh, from auto manufacturers to get more EVs on the road. Um, rare as they may be. Uh, for example, you know, Chevy Bolt recently expanded their recall uh, due to fire risks. Um, some Tesla models have caught fire as well, um, as you guys are well aware. Um, how great of a challenge do you foresee EV safety issues becoming? Um, and have they put a damper on consumer confidence? Not so far, but it's a really serious thing, especially at Ford. Um, We've had our issues too, the plug-in uh, Kuga in Europe, uh, you know, battery manufacturing at high scale, um, you know, with the current chemistries you have access to, uh, you know, there's there's always a risk. There's great, it's encouraging to see uh, iron phosphate make the progress it's doing in China um, that has a much lower thermal risk. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why China really felt like that technology had advantages. They're now addressing the weaknesses of LFP uh, with longer range, better cold, wear, cold uh, weather uh, performance. I, I think this is just, you know, like any change in technology, but this is human safety and well-being. We, we have to, you know, all, all, all of our brands are going to pay a lot of attention to this uh, you know, I had the chance to go through a battery plant a couple times now, and for an old school automotive person, to me, it was so impressive to see the 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 uh, the way the manufacturing process has to be wired up to be you know minimize uh, risk. But anyways, you know, volatile um, materials. We we have to you know we have to be careful. We have to think about these things in advance and we have to be very responsive when there are problems. Um, so far, you know, I, I, I think um, so far, I think we have not seen an issue with demand. Uh, 
uh, China was also ahead of the US in uh, at least temporarily banning the use of recycled car batteries for um, storage purposes uh, because of concerns about safety and fires. And if we can't solve the problem quickly, that will take away one of the major options for what to do with uh, car batteries once they've reached the end of their useful life for propulsion. That is the next question I was going to turn to from the audience. There was an audience member who was interested in battery reuse, uh, what new circular business models are being introduced considering EV lifespan, the kind of goals, Jim, you are talking about, and then many other companies as well. I mean, the, the scale of increase, the magnitude, the amount of minerals we'll need, the, number, the, 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 the volume of batteries that will need to be recycled, reused, or otherwise addressed, that, that, that waste stream. Can you talk a little bit about where you see that going, what the role of and responsibility of a company like Ford is in that and where the, how the technology is going to evolve? You know, I think government policy is extremely variable. Mary would know more about recycling and whose responsibility it will be. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, all countries uh, have different policies. Um, you know, the recycling process has always been very efficient. Um, but we are entering a new era, era with battery electric vehicles. Uh, we invested $50 million with Redwood for, for this reason. We think that recycling is not only critical for cost, but for the company's capability. Um, you know, even in the brand new battery manufacturing, uh, batteries get scrapped and we wanna make sure that we reuse those materials as efficiently as possible. And I think Redwood has a great technology to do that. Uh, but I, this is gonna be a long journey. Uh, we have to make investments. Um, and I think we're more than willing to take on the responsibility uh, of, of handling the vehicle after it's used for life. Our, um, our final video question comes from Dan Prop, who just graduated uh, recently from the School of International Public Affairs with an MPA concentration in energy and environment. And for those who may not have seen it, has an excellent op-ed in the LA Times uh, just a few days ago about how youth are viewing the climate crisis. It's a really important perspective and, and very well written. Dan, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And my question is a little bit on that topic. We've seen a number of companies commit to taking action on the climate crisis through net zero commitments or EV commitments or otherwise. And unfortunately, many of these companies have fallen short of their commitments. Um, and I think as a result, consumers and young people have an inherent suspicion for this sort of commitment. So what can company leaders do today to convince people that their commitments to climate action are genuine? I'll be consistent um, and, and write policies that aren't aspirations, but you have real physicals behind them. Uh, when we committed to California and to Paris Accord, you know, it wasn't popular in DC at the time. Um, other companies have uh, changed their tune really quickly, which is exciting, but I see way too many, in our view, aspirations of some days, you know, I've always wanted to be 6'2". I'm not going to be 6'2". Um, and uh, I, I think from our standpoint, um, you know, we're out in the market now. Our vehicles are, are frankly out, oversold. Uh, we have a long way. We're in the second inning of this journey. But, uh, you know, I would just hope that commitments aren't just for net, you know, carbon neutrality, that they acknowledge the complexity of this transition in its entirety. That means supply chain, labor, and all the other things that we have to solve for it, Mary has mentioned, I've mentioned. Um, and I, I think at least to four, that's how we'll approach it. Uh, try to accelerate as fast as we can, but we also want to get more things right than just the propulsion. And, um, you know, I, I, and be consistent as a company, irregardless of the political wins. So I'm going to um, maybe uh, help Jim out with uh, part of his job, which is I'm going to answer the question um, in a slightly different way. Uh, as a former government official and someone who has worked in the public interest sector, both of which were incredibly important and impactful places to work, um, I often tell people that they should look at 
going to work in the private sector. So I think companies such as Ford, but many others that have good intentions also need a workforce that can help figure all those things out. And they're looking for people who not only are outstanding engineers and builders, but also uh, people who can think more broadly about sustainability and raise questions uh, and who will insist on having answers to those questions, which I hope, uh, Daniel, you know, you and uh, your generation are, are gonna do. There's a, another audience question uh, about I think related to what's happening in Washington now, maybe Mary, you want to take it, but Jimmy can weigh in too on the wisest way to spend potential federal infrastructure dollars to ensure the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. Um, may see a moment in Washington now when we're going to have a lot of government dollars spent on infrastructure. Mary, can you talk about what you'd like to see come out of that? What would make sure. a difference? Um, and the role of the government in the charging infrastructure in particular? Right. Well, historically, um, when money comes through for energy programs, uh, the Department of Energy has been very good at getting it out to the states and the states in turn to local governments. And that's how we got a huge number of uh, homes, for example, and businesses retrofitted, uh, you know, to to be more energy efficient and got a lot of uh, a lot of other infrastructure built along the way as well. Um, so I would assume that that's going to be the biggest way in which money flows uh, from the federal government out to, to the locals. But I am hoping that we're going to see, again, as we've talked before, um, a broader array of partners brought into this discussion than just the historical energy agencies or uh, air regulatory agencies uh, or environmental regulatory agencies in general, and that there's an opportunity for communities uh, to come in with proposals and for, frankly, there to be some matching here, maybe not necessarily in terms of, of finance, but, you know, the biggest obstacle to quick rollout of electric charging in California has not been the lack of funds that were available for it because we were able to secure a lot of money as a result of the Volkswagen diesel scandal uh, and, and other funds, uh, which could not be spent as quickly as I know uh, the company wanted to because of inability to get sites. And the sites were in many cases uh, held up by either local zoning regulations, just lowness of the permitting process, uh, fire marshal concerns. You know, California is, is perhaps known for being tough in that regard, but every state has its own set of uh, difficulties in making things like this happen. So if we can find ways to um, help to streamline some of the decision-making, um, I'm not so worried about uh, you know, putting a charging station in the wrong place. Um, the, the thing that tends to worry me the most is what happens after it's installed. What's going to be the lifetime uh, maintenance process and updating it so that uh, people can actually utilize it. I mean, I'm one of many people I know who have, have a need to be, who sometimes has encountered uh, problems with just utilizing the charging network that's out there. So um, th there's a whole realm of questions, as Jim was saying before, that are like the second level questions or maybe even the third level questions, but we're gonna have to start addressing them uh, pretty quickly if we're gonna get to the very ambitious goals that we have. Maybe Jim, I could get a final comment from you coming back to where you started on those second order questions, access, affordability, workforce, um, on, on your final thoughts on sort of how we how we address those how, how do we move forward and try to take those more seriously companies regulators um what needs to be done i remember my, my grandfather was an early employee of ford he worked at the rouge here hourly worker and he said to me jim if you're feeling awkward you're growing i think we just got to keep walking <laughs> uh you know walking through all of this um and uh yeah i, I think the capital has been deployed I think Mary said it best, you know, governments and, and companies have deployed uh, the resources. Now we have to be smart about uh, how we roll this out and execute. 
Um, but I'm really optimistic about where we're going as a society. Uh, I think finally, um, it, it feels like there's more alignment that there ever has been in the, in the past, but the execution uh, decisions aren't any easier because of that alignment. Um, but but I, I'm, I think we're all very encouraged and we're all excited. You know, I, I want to touch on something quickly that Mary said. We are seeing people come to Ford that we have never seen before because they see this transition as a reason to work in our industry. I have never seen that in my 40 years of this industry. There are a lot of people like me, model builders, racers, all that stuff, because we love cars. But we have a whole new group of people who are coming to Ford because they want to do something that will change the world. And they can't afford. Um, so that gives me deep optimism about uh, where we're going. It is good to conclude on a note of optimism. Thank you, uh, Jim Farley, Mary Nichols, for making time to be with us today. Uh, thanks to the audience for tuning in. As we mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policies website later today. Our discussion will also be released as a special edition of the Columbia Energy Exchange podcast. <laughs> Uh, our next event, how are China's companies responding to China's 2060 carbon neutrality goal will be held on Wednesday, September 29th at noon. Please join us. And today's discussion concludes the series of uh, virtual events that the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of Climate Week NYC. If you've missed any of those events or would like to rewatch, please visit us online. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much.